Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come today. Um, I didn't mean to come dressed as an undertaker. I've got a, I've got a young, young child, so things, are, things, things aren't quite in order. So, as you heard, I'm from Strathclyde University, which is in Glasgow, which is in Scotland, which is in the United Kingdom for the time being. Um, and that's, probably, that's probably where I'd start because my talk registers how there's now quite a burgeoning literature on the idea of Scottish nationhood in terms of the constitutional question or in terms of national identity, uh, and also as either a mass phenomenon or as a political kind of elite phenomenon. But it's not really very clear um, where ethnic and racial minorities come to rest in this debate. Um, we don't really know in terms of uh, in terms of what Stuart Hall said. Uh, we don't really know whether the outside has been brought into the middle or the periphery into the centre when we talk about Scottish nationhood and Scottish national identity. Instead, we often talk about what's sometimes called the New Scots, which I think is a very problematic term because it implies a hierarchy between kind of the old Scots and, I guess, people like me in my case. Um, and I think that social scientists, and particularly scholars of nationalism, really tended to overlook this question. Um, and I'm especially interested in this paper in what I characterise as um, elite political kind of argumentation. And so I'm going to talk to you about some work I've been doing with elite political actors in Scotland over a few small projects over the last few years. And there are three particular tropes of argumentation which I think that they deploy when you speak to them about how Scottish national identity, Scottish nationhood is being developed and imagined. And the first I characterise as an aspirational pluralism, the second um, concerns the ways in which they use empire to narrate their story of what Scottish national identity is. And the third is about boundaries, um, kind of issues and things which um, might be too much kind of recognition, might, might kind of fragment the existing settlement of whatever Scotland is. Okay, so why, with some exceptions, am I claiming at the beginning that social scientists have overlooked this question of where I think racial minorities sit in Story. Well, I think a full answer will probably take up all my time. Thank you, Frank. Um, I can point you here to a recent article in which I tried to elaborate this at some length. But here, minimally, we might be able to say, well, firstly, it's been argued that the comparatively smaller presence of ethnic and racial minorities in Scotland um, has meant this has been less salient, or, and indeed, that the, um, that the way in which ethnic minorities in Scotland have or have not been politicised it's quite dissimilar to England. So those two issues, to some extent, kind of come together to explain why social scientists have overlooked this question. I think taking the first issue, um, it's true that there are fewer black ethnic minority groups in Scotland than there are in England. The most recent census told us that nearly 4%, or which is about 2,000 people um, in Scotland, um, consider themselves to be black ethnic minorities. Um, and that's very different to England, where the figure is more uh, closer to about 14%. However, interestingly, the Scottish uh, percentage is double what it was in 2001, and it predicted to be up to 10% by the middle of the century. Um, what I find especially striking about these kinds of figures is that you need to read it in the context of um, the decline in Scottish population and the low level of fertility and outward migration, and the extent to which inward net migration has contributed to Scottish population growth. This is from the General Register of Scotland. It puts it in some historical context, and just what I wanted to flag up to you was this, which is the most recent slide. I get hold of. And what it tells us is that traditionally net migration to Scotland counts people who come in from England as well. And by the early part of this decade, we found that net migration into Scotland from overseas was exceeding net migration into Scotland from England. Now that's quite significant, and there are a few other places I would suggest in the UK where that's the case. Often people talk about London as being the hub, uh, centre of international migration. It's very true, it is. But the largest part of the migration to London, or London's population change, has been movement to London from elsewhere in the UK, not to London from outside the UK. So, so that's kind of one issue. The first issue is about numbers. And to some extent, I find that numbers rationale is often quite deployed in, in a bit of a defensive fashion, really. Um, and I found the second issue more interesting, which says that because of historical conditions, post-war labour migration to Scotland wasn't racialised as it was in England. And that's not to say that racial narratives have ever been you know, entirely absent from 
Scotland. I think a, a cursory look at some of the formalised histories of Scotland contain ideas of race in all its various manifestations. Yet, as the late quote unquote, is not dead, just given up on this topic, Bob Miles used to say, the Notting Hill riots in 1958 in London were portrayed in Scotland not as race riots, but as English riots. And I think that kind of gives you a sense of the diverging, um, diverging kind of repertoire in which kind of race was being understood in Scotland and in England at that earlier time. And the more substantive contribution that people like Bob Miles make is that they say that minorities who came to Scotland came to rest in a political dynamic that was chiefly organised around Scotland's economic relationship to England. Whereas in England, they came to rest within a context where they were seen as markers of post-imperial decline. Now, I think that kind of framing is really interesting and promising, but I think it's really been uh, withering on the vine somewhat for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I think that scholars of nationalism in Scotland have, willingly or unwillingly, been cast under a strange and dazzling spell um, by territorial politics and people who are interested in sociology. David McCrone who's the sociologist at Edinburgh, emeritus now, put this nicely about 30 years ago when he said that, you know, in understanding nationalism, we're faced with the danger of electoralism, you know, of reading psychological entrance and pronouncing on the inevitability or victory of nationalism. And I think what he was complaining about there, something that I would complain about now, is that in understanding national nationalism through electoral politics, you lose a lot of the kind of a, a thick description, you lose a lot of the critical capacity of social sciences to understand and tell a story about one nation. Ah. On the other hand, I feel that um, the scholarship of, of uh, race in Scotland is now increasingly a West of Scotland activity with myself and a few colleagues in Glasgow who are really kind of pushing this, I think. I don't think it's massively high on the agendas of scholars of nationalism in Scotland. So they're very good, I think, at looking at the Balkans and elsewhere, increasingly India now, but very rarely do they look out the window and tell the story about contemporary Scotland through a nationalism studies register. This is despite, I think, race being a salient social issue in Scotland. The next slide I've, I've put up is the recent death in custody of a, of a young man, um, Sheikh Abayu, in um, Kakodi. Um, Sheikh Abayu was sat on by seven police officers, says four there, seven in fact, and one of whom with 25 stones. Um, and a whole set of characteristics of what we understood as institutional police racism with the Metropolitan Police uh, could be attributed to this case and are kind of working their way out. Um, so it's not the case that kind of race isn't an issue in Scotland in terms of kind of events, but we also know from um, survey work, the survey I conducted earlier this year over the summer, where a third of the respondents said that they had been subject of racial discrimination in the last five years. And 60% of those um, didn't bother to report it, um, which was, you know, which is really interesting and something which is overlooked, I think, in Scotland in a way that's not necessarily in England. Now, I think this has been a real unfortunate tendency at a time when all the political parties of Scotland are kind of jockeying over a vision of what the nation is. So not just the nationalists. So yes, there's sometimes a very fierce scramble over who owns Scottish nationalism. But it isn't just about the SNP, it's about the Scottish Liberal, the Scottish Greens, the Scottish Conservative and Union Party, the Scottish Labour Party. Um, and, and while the constitutional uh, issues that came in the referendum in 2014 really kind of, um, kind of gave a flaw to that, the question of race wasn't really discussed at all. So, why political elites in Scotland, and who do I have in mind? Well, it's said that over the last 15 years, a distinct political class has emerged in Scotland, uh, with its own career trajectory, uh, which is very separate from the UK one. Uh, but interestingly, this doesn't necessarily break with what's gone before. Rather, the devolution has accelerated um, the trend towards a professional middle class leadership. Now, what remains unknown is how, these, um, how this kind of uh, new political class uh, think about minority difference. I've been very interested not only in members of the Scottish Parliament, who I'm going to talk about some of the interview data with now, um, but I've also been interested in people who might think of uh, forming a wider body of elites of politics facilitate, in politics facilitating occupation. You know, these include journalists, <coughs> lobbyists, barristers, financiers, amongst others. 
Uh, and they're precisely the kind of people who pop, it, pop up um, in the nationalism studies, when the nationalism studies talks about elites um, and how cultures and politics are forged by small minorities, normally one kind of elite or another, not to quote from Anthony, from Anthony Smith. So drawing on some of the interview data, I'm going I'm to um, identify these three kind of um, these three kind of repertoires of argumentation. The first I call an aspirational pluralism, which speaks to a consensus amongst both uh, unionists and independents that what's going on in Scotland is something very civic. Um, it's not about uh, an ethnic uh, exclusivism, um, but they offer different reasons. For that. The next kind of argumentative trope concerns how each use the idea of um, Scotland's uh, historical identity as a means of servicing their, their account, uh, and especially how it's centered around the issue of empire. And third, as I indicated at the beginning, concerns this issue of integration, quote unquote, and how much too, and how too much difference risks being fragmentary or unpicking, as I've called it, civil peace. Okay. So an aspirational pluralism. So the historic historian Tom Devine has proposed that we can understand the incremental self-confidence expressed by political actors in Scotland as a kind of aspirational nationalism. This he allies to a broader social transformation uh, and cultural renaissance that's parallel the devolution process and shift towards the service-based economy. Now, a key question for me is whether this aspirational nationalism also includes an aspirational pluralism. And here I think we find um, a consensus across the unionists and nationalists that a project of diverse nation-building is underway. I'm going to give you four expressions of this. Two from unionists, uh, Scottish Labour and Scottish Liberal Democrats, and two from nationalists or independents, the Scottish National Party and the Scottish Greens. Um, one, the first one, very much gains kind of um, um, traction from Scotland's historical multinational diversity. And there's two frames at work here. This is the first frame. Um, and this is deemed as a kind of, a, kind of an inheritance of Scotland. Um, which is expressed very much in the first one. So this is a Scottish Green one. You're saying to me, it's inherently uh, a multinational, multi-ethnic, multilingual, multicultural entity. It can't be anything else. So to, so to you know, an attack on multiculturalism doesn't make sense uh, because it's abundantly clear that the UK is not one single culture anywhere, and never has been. Um, the Scottish Liberal Democrat tells us that the experience of history to some extent, but also its kind of proud tradition of assimilating waves of different groups in a way that sustains population in many communities. I think that's a far more diverse and vibrant and interesting cultural mix. So beginning with this first tendency in these two quotes, to place Scotland's, um, to place Scotland's diversity within a historical register of multinationalism kind of assumes that it's served to some extent as what you might call a prophylactic against exclusivity, or at least that it facilitated an inclusive vision. And it's a hypothesis that we can, we can partly test. So if we survey the attitudes of Scottish majorities, white majorities, to claims making by minorities in Scotland on Scottish nationhood, uh, Macron and Bacchifer point to a small but consistent ethnic penalty, they call it, which reveals itself marginally more so in Scotland than in England, where um, being Scottish um, is possibly more likely to equate with being white in Scotland than it is in England. And they frame it like this. They say that if you ask a white English person in England whether somebody who is non-white can be English, you know, around half will say no. If you say to a white English person in England that somebody non-white with an English accent can be English, well, that resistance goes down. And if that person can show that they've got English parents, then it's just a quarter which rejects their claim on Englishness. In Scotland, um, you start with a higher number. So if you're not white, um, uh, you're denied Scottishness. Uh, you know, to about 60 percent of respondents will do so. But that drops if you've got a Scottish accent. And if you can show Scottish parentage, you know, that number drops significantly again. But you can see that there's kind of an ethnic penalty across all of that in comparison to England. As they kind of show, a resident of Scotland is deemed a weak claim of Scottish national identity, so I can't be Scottish. But when markers such as accent are added, which my daughter will have, between 50% and 60% of people can accept that claim of Scottishness. But introducing parentage implies you know, a blood link, an ethnic link, 
um, that produces the biggest increase in acceptance. Now, what should we make of that? Well, I guess I would say that while the disproportionately higher rejection rates towards non-white people in Scotland compared with England is certainly worrying, the authors try to make the case to say that it's important not to exceptionalize Scotland, um, because although they are more exclusionary than England, they're not radically so. Um, what instead they want to do, and others too, is say that it's striking how ethnic minorities in Scotland, much more so than their counterparts in England, will appropriate their self-defined self, um, hyphenated identity, e.g. You know, Scottish, Pakistani, Scottish, Chinese, Scottish, something else. Now that's actually quite a well-established trend, and political elites pick up on that too, and they report it in their responses to questions. And I suppose the really striking feature is that kind of subjective um, um, confidence and willingness to kind of, amongst minorities, to stake a claim on Scottishness in a way that's not the case in Englishness. And you, you know, we see this over uh, the survey data longitudinally, so this is from the Labour Force survey in England. And you can see the extent to which Britishness has much uh, smaller traction in Scotland <coughs> because, well, relative to England, because in, in, in England, ethnic minorities um, don't self-identify with Englishness. Englishness is very much a wall, so they will identify with Britishness, whereas in Scotland, Scottishness is a bridge, um, which is an interesting, an interesting distinction. But we're still within the first, first phrase of this, the kind of first, first frame of thinking about this aspirational pluralism. Um, so the first kind of frame is, oh well, Scotland's historical experience of being within a multinational region to act as a proper land. But what's the second one? Oh, there have been no surveys in Scotland on how ethnic minorities voted in 2014 independence referendum. The only one that's been mistaken is mine. Um, and I, I kind of did it out of curiosity because I was doing this other survey. And that's not the answer. <laughs> 38 votes for, 38 votes vote against. This is from a sample of 50 or 500. Um, but it's a representative sample. I'm going to skip over that. Um, the second frame within this aspirational pluralism is more active, insofar as Scottish political actors will claim that Scottish national identity has been cast in an inclusive mould, not least by them. So here's a first uh, respondent, a uh, Scottish Labour Party respondent, who says, look, I don't want to pat ourselves on the back. But this is really to the credit of the Scottish Parliament. You know, we've led the way, and other parties have brought it all in line, because we're the only kind of really big players here. Um, the second perhaps puts it more uh, pointedly. We've captured nationalism. We've made it something positive. We've made it civic. That's been, you know, been a decade of work. It doesn't just happen overnight. So how accurate is that view? That political elites have actively steered Scottish nationhood into a more inclusive direction. Well, we might point to political speeches and the way in which Alex Salmond, when he was first minister, would say that Scotland is not Quebec. Uh, we here follow the path of civic nationalism, so we've got political rhetoric. We might think about policy phraseology, the way in which the Scottish government talks about all the people of Scotland rather than Scottish people. But I would suggest that there's possibly a kind of an instrumental logic in insofar as political elites have had a powerful incentive to try to recruit minorities into their national project, uh, both to disprove charges of ethnic exclusivism, but also to build an internal consensus. It would seem self-evident, right? Better to draw the boundary around as many people as possible, better to have them inside the tent than outside if you're trying to govern the kingdom. And I think What's especially interesting about the responses from elite political actors is that they deem that to be a self-conscious goal. Um, because it starts to distinguish Scotland from other minority autonomy-seeking nations. Here we might include the way in which the Basque Nationalist Party has until recently stipulated that you have to have four Basque grandparents to be a member of the party. Or the way in which the Quebec um, separatists have for a long time talked about the importance of Quebec de Souche old stock, and sometimes we hear the Front National talk about uh, France de Souche, you know, uh, French, old French stock. I would think about the way in which um, the kind of the political conditions in Scotland have encouraged a much more open and welcoming approach to the issue of 
um, asylum, asylum and refugees. The, the national newspaper was created after the 2014 independence referendum, um, very much sponsored by people within the Scottish National Party, not funded by the Scottish Government, but sponsored kind of intellectually and politically by them, because there was, only, there was no paper which supported the independence referendum except the Herald. Um, when 45% of the population voted for independence, it felt like there was a vacuum there. Um, so they're very close to the SNP. Uh, and you can see the kinds of uh, front pages they've kind of, um, all the kind of editorial lines they've taken on refugee and asylum status, in a striking contrast, I think, to the ways in which um, refugee, uh, refugees and asylum seekers have been portrayed in some of the national press in England. And interestingly, lots of the stuff in the national press in England isn't replicated in the same press in Scotland. So the Daily Mail's cartoon of refugees and rats wasn't printed in Scotland, nor was the front page of the Sun's poll, uh, one in five Muslims had sympathy with uh, the terrorists. Um, that was a completely different front cover in Scotland, which I think in and of itself is quite revealing. So I think kind of, um, I think that makes for uh, a striking contrast, because uh, it's quite pluralistic um, rhetoric, um, which portrays quite a low threshold for inclusion. Uh, and while the distinction, I think, between civic uh, and ethnic is, is self-evidently problematic, it kind of makes sense why the late Bashir Ahmed, who was the first ethnic minority member of the Scottish Parliament, could confidently state, if you're a member of Parliament for, um, for the SNP, um, to confidently state, it isn't important where you're from, it's what matters is where you're going together as a nation. And Nicola Sturgeon has very much picked that up as her mantra about Scottish national identity. Yet, historical experience evidently casts a shadow over contemporary, expression, contemporary expressions of nationhood in nearly all cases. And to this, I would like to turn next. So I said that, um, I'll skip over this, but I'll have to come back to it later, uh, if it's appropriate. I said that Scottish elite political actors use the idea of the history of Scotland as a means to articulate why and in what way it's more inclusive or open. So Scottish elite political actors frequently invoke experiences of empire, and allied to that, but also slightly separate, the history of Scotland as, a, as an emigrant sending nation when they're talking about pluralism. Uh, what's especially interesting for our uh, uh, purposes is this tension over the ways in which national narratives have to remain to some extent largely positive and not dwell too much on the imperial sins of the past. How then is Scotland's role in empire and the historical impact this has had upon various interconnected spheres of Scottish society negotiated by my respondents? Well, one prevailing trope we might characterise as an expeditionary kind of proteo it's an appetite born for diversity out, seeking it out of the century. You know, this is something illustrated in responses from um, the following two quotations, both, uh, from both unionists and nationalists. Um, I won't read all of this, but I'll just say, I'll read the last part from a Liberal Democrat member of the Scottish Parliament. I think the more outward looking you are, the more prepared you are to go out and experience different cultures. <coughs> this is the story of empire. Uh, the more receptive, probably, your community is to that reverse process. Um, Scottish people have a recognition of their part in the British Empire. Uh, and that when you've been part of an empire, uh, part of the Commonwealth as well, that you're part of a world society. And that you have a responsibility, that's the most Scottish nationalist responding. It's evident, isn't it, that each focuses on the very positive inheritance of empire, um, which is from our predict. But it's also intriguing to know that neither refuses ownership of empire. Now, it's a tension which hasn't gone unnoticed by critics. Um, Yadmil Albay Brown, um, some years ago, put it nicely, actually, put it nicer than some academics have, where she said that nationalists declare themselves victims of colonialism, conveniently forgetting how many of them strutted around from barking orders of the natives and relishing their sun uh, So there's certainly something in how empire complicates the post-colonial dimensions of a secessionist nationalist discourse, because it highlights a common imperial experience. And that kind of limits the kind of manoeuvres that you can make uh, as nationalists. But there's also a kind of a persistent ambiguity that I find when we're talking about empire and uh, post-colonialism in Scotland. And it's something um, which is picked up in Hussein and Miller's study, Multi Multicultural Nationalism. Um, and they do quite a lot of interviews with ethnic minorities in Scots. And they often 
report this statement. They say that ethnic minorities in Scotland will say to them, quote, Scots understand colonialism from their past history. They understand how ethnic minorities feel. And it's kind of reminiscent of how Bernie Brand would say, look, it would stick in my throat to call myself English. I call myself British because that allies me with other oppressed peoples like the Welsh and the Scots. So there's kind of an internalisation of ethnic minorities, uh, amongst ethnic minorities in Scotland, of this narrative of Scotland being historically oppressed, when in fact, you know, counter history might say, well, something between a third and a half of the civil service grade of the uh, East India Trading Company were Scots. And when you think about the size of the population at the time, that's incredible. When you think about people like General Napier who annexed the Sindh province, which is a large part of contemporary Pakistan, without a uh, parliamentary war, he just did it because he wanted it. Um, when you think about all the other colonial historical activities of Scotland, it's interesting that ethnic minorities in Scotland have internalised the narrative of Scotland as historically oppressed. I think a more persuasive manoeuvre that respondents make uh, and the way in which they might harness empire um, is in this kind of relatively pro-immigration pro argument made by this uh, Liberal Democrat, uh, MSP. And good gosh, you can't have British history and not be that. So why have very restrictive immigration policy in that particular in that kind of area? You know, do we want to be more international? So in different ways, I think these readings are competing to select from all that's gone before uh, and, uh, and find something distinctive, truly ours, to kind of mark out Scotland as having a unique and shared, uh, open, pluralistic identity. Um, and while this is in part, I think, uh, a historical activity, it also has observable contemporary implications. And I'd like to turn to this next when I'm talking about boundaries for integration. So the Canadian political theorist Will Kimlicker argues that multinational settlements are often provisional in the accommodation of minority, ethnic minority claims, suggesting that there's often a big gap or a distance between the reasonable um, aspirations of minorities and the degree to which they'll be accommodated by uh, my minority states, minority national states. And there's very much a tangible expression of this in Scotland. Political elites often point to boundaries for ensuring integration as they understand it and promoting unity. Two examples of this include the issue of multilingualism and multifaithism. If you take the issue of language first, the national languages um, of Scotland include Gaelic, of which there are just over uh, 59,000 speakers, and which has seen quite important advances in its recognition in recent years. It wasn't until 2005 that there the um, Gaelic Language Act was introduced, which created a board which was deemed to be important for securing, I quote, the status of Gaelic as the official language of Scotland, commanding equal respect to English. So there's kind of a movement for bilingualism going on. And in my time in Edinburgh, I've seen Gaelic schools open up in Scotland, in, in Edinburgh, on the East Coast, where traditionally there hasn't been a uh, Gaelic speaking community. Um, and when I speak to um, respondents, particularly people from the northeast of Scotland, they will say, "Well, what can Gaelic got to do with us? You know, we've got much more in common with the northern traditions. Um, you know, um, Gaelic is something which goes on over there. It's not really Scotland. It's not really national." Now, amongst the rationales that are put forward um, is that, and this is a quote from, uh, from an academic, is that um, Gaelic is an element of Scotchness because it's not spoken elsewhere. However, um, you might also say that um, Gaelic isn't a kind of an entry tariff into Scottish national identity. People don't need to speak Gaelic to be Scottish. So it's not as though it's aggressively promoted. It's not like the bilingualism of Quebec or Catalonia or Basque uh, region. So it's not kind of promoted on that level. It's much more of a symbolic activity. Yet the question that it raises is of bringing other Scottish languages into the fold. And I suppose what I've got in mind is languages that are spoken more frequently, particularly Scottish Urdu and Scottish Punjabi. There are more Scottish Urdu and Scottish Punjabi speakers in Scotland than there are Gaelic speakers. And Urdu and Punjabi in Scotland isn't languages that man would have to speak. They've taken on very distinctive tones, distinctive dialects, and they've evolved and they've changed. And so when I kind of put that to uh, political actors, I, I get this kind of response from the Conservative respondent. And he kind of rehearses this narrative that, well, Gaelic is a privileged position for reasons of history, 
but also we don't want to encourage too many languages because it will cultivate communities being sectioned off and they can't therefore communicate with people outside of their own immediate society and I think that's very dangerous. So you get this sense of kind of a possible fragmentation. If you recognise too much diversity, you will encourage a degree of fragmentation. Now I'm not going to use other examples to kind of illustrate that point because I think it's typical of the kind I had, even though other people used uh, less, uh, less kind of uh, robust language. I'd rather move on to what I think is possibly a more charged example, uh, which concerns the prospects for religious pluralism in Scotland. Now, religious pluralism can be thought about in different ways, and the way in which I've got in mind would concern corporate recognition, anything up to how the Catholics secured various gains as part of, you know, part of a, a settlement in terms of what's sometimes called Catholic emancipation in Scotland, which came with the restoration in 1878 of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church in Scotland. That's a very formal and cooperative mode of recognising religion. Um, when I put to Scottish MSPs, well, what does that mean for newer religious minorities? Um, can they kind of get comparable settlements? Maybe not in terms of what was best suited to another minority in another time, but can the corporate public recognition of religion in Scotland include Islam, Hinduism, Sikhism, Judaism, amongst others? Um, and they, they're, you know, they're like, oh well, why not? Scotland is a plural, uh, multi-religious society, therefore, where you know we, we accommodate everybody. Why not? Offer an example. Well, what about something like when it matters, something like religious education? Uh, and there was there was there was a uh, agreement across the piece in terms of the kind of responses that I got here. Um, it's a controversial topic. I don't think it's a great idea. Uh, I think that the scars of a kind of a sectarian divide that we've had there are probably more of a focus of attention in terms of things that we need to resolve. You know, that's from a Liberal Democrat. I think it would be extremely depressing to think that in 50 or 60 years' time, Muslims were no more integrated than that. Um, I'm not keen on it, you know. So what's going on, I think, here is that Scottish political actors are taking the experience of historical sectarianism in Scotland and pulling it over and drawing it over the possibilities of um, a, a multi-religious contemporary Scotland. And there are, of course, some very good reasons to be cautious about trying to seek to mirror uh, one settlement in the present with something from the past. Uh, and I have to stress that all respondents were very, very positive, often you know, incredibly so, about the fact of religious pluralism in Scotland. But what's interesting in these responses, as I say, is how each frames the question of formally recognising religious pluralism as opposed to the fact of religious pluralism within a register of sectarianism. And the clear danger for a newer religious minority is, is that they come to be framed by political elites within this kind of historical register rather than according to their own dynamics. Um, this would include, you know, something which happens within a democratic discourse and makes explicit the grounds on which, um, you know, proposals might be accommodated or not accommodated. Uh, and in many respects, I think it kind of goes to the heart of this tension between um, historical established diversity and newer ethnic minority diversity, insofar as there is a tendency for historically established minority nations to dictate the terms of participation to newer minorities. How do you have time? A couple minutes? So, I might, I might wrap up there actually and leave, leave a bit more time to finish. So, in conclusion, in terms of thinking about uh, multinationalism and multiculturalism, we can say that yes, Scottish nationhood is very much premised on a self evident, um, uh, pre uh, is not premised on self evident ethnic criteria. You know, in this respect, it is at least safe. Respondents aren't deploying notions of blood and soil to prevent newer minorities from claiming Scottish national identity, nor are ethnic minorities in Scotland themselves feeling inhibited from claiming national identity. Ethnic minorities in Scotland have done something that ethnic minorities in Quebec, Catalonia, um, and, uh, and uh, the Basque region haven't done. You know, they've, they've taken an ownership over the idea of Scotland. Um, but in many respects, I think you know, elite political actors are kind of behind the trend there, insofar as they use what I think of as a historical hierarchy and map that onto the story 
of newer minority. The Scottish flag, the Saltai, is a Christian cross. Is that up for conversation? I imagine it will be at some point. The Canadians used to have a Christian cross on their flag, and now they have a maple leaf. Um, it leaves me with the question of to what extent um, Scotland needs a much more multicultural conception of multinationalism. And it's one of the concerns that those of us have in terms of thinking about the independence debate. If Scotland's kind of other is England, what happens when its other is internal? Um, and finally, I suppose it's a it's a charge or a challenge really for colleagues in nationalism studies more broadly to do this work and really to open up new debates. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. When, when someone moves from England to Scotland, you have some figures up there. Yeah. Before. How's that measured? Because there's no there's no crossing a the border as such there. The census. Right. Okay. So that's all census data. Then. Right. Okay. I didn't I didn't see that. Yeah. Sorry. I should have spent time explaining that. That's all right. That's all right. No. That makes sense. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. I was recently up in Glasgow for the World Gymnastics. Oh right. Yeah. And read a very interesting. A published report by the Red Cross who had followed about um, probably six immigrant families. Yeah. Not not immediate, but yeah. you know, historical. And I'm just wondering, with the welcome that the Syrian immigrants are going to get, how will they help them to integrate and cope with any um, adverse feeling against them? Yeah. Well, I mean, because kind of, they are very welcoming. That that came forward while we were there that they were welcoming. There's going to be quite a lot of them we settled in that area. Yeah. Is it? I think Scotland has it's about two thousand and twenty. Mm. Essentially, yes. yeah. Um, I mean, because there's funding allocated to the resettlement yeah. of Syrian refugees, it makes the challenge a bit easier. They'll have accommodation. Yeah. They'll yes. have um, allowances. Um, hopefully, they'll have um, skills and training to get them into the labour market. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they're hopefully they'll be fast tracked into naturalisation as well, they'll be formally admitted. Mm -hmm. um, so, you're right, so I mentioned the issue of the refugees just in terms of the prevailing discourse, mm -hmm. and I think it does diverge between Scotland and England. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, in, in the specific answer to your question, I think it will be, you know, it will be done in terms of mm -hmm. governance. Um, but the implications it has for thinking about Scottish national identity. Um, it's one of the things that the Scottish government can say, we do differently, we do better, we're nicer, because it has no responsibility for policing its boundaries. So the Scottish government, in the last iteration, um, when it was a minority government, made a lot, got a lot of currency out of the issue of Dungable and child detention of Dungable, quite rightly so, beyond the demonstration myself. But they could do that and say it's a nasty English at Westminster. We wouldn't put people in here. Well, you wouldn't, whilst you don't have competence for that, whilst it's not a political matter. So it's not the case that party politics in Scotland is informed by the immigration debate. Um, if Scotland was responsible for immigration policy, it would be <coughs> very quickly. And Scotland would stand out in Western Europe, if not in the world as somebody who uh, you know, were, were, were very kind of pro-migration. Um, so it's, I think it's politically very contingent at this stage. And I, I think it's driven by goodwill, consistency, that kind of an ethical view. But they, that's the space for that when you don't have UKIP on your doorstep banging on about the money. Well, I, I found this, this little booklet in the Mitchell Library. I have to say, all of the families reported upon have been so positive about their resettlement and hope that yeah. was the thing that came through. So if you're near the Mitchell Library, you'll see this oh, thank you. Thanks, Red Mr. Cross. Yeah, it's thank interesting. Yeah. Yes. yes. This isn't a, a very well-formed question, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the, the potential gap between 
political rhetoric yeah. on the one hand yeah. and the actual situation yeah. on the ground and, and, and where I took about political rhetoric but obviously the way that translates into policy. Angela Merkel said a few years ago multiculturalism has failed. Uh, uh, Francois Hollande would no doubt say the same thing except they don't think about it. Yeah. Multiculturalism, they think about citizenship, and, yeah. you know, the, the race dimension is, is written out. Cameron said multiculturalism is failing. I mean, my own view is that it was never given a chance anyway. But then, you know, we're battening down the hatches in England yeah. uh, as much as possible, and yet Scotland is saying for reasons of population decline, yeah. that it wants to encourage yeah. immigration. So, multiculturalism, in a sense, is a fact of life, yeah. both in England. And in Scotland, and yet the politicians seem to be, certainly in England, busy denying it. And I'm, I'm not quite sure from the quotes that you've given mm -hmm. us whether there's a really different political culture there. And I'd also say, just by the way, that thing about historically familiar, I'm not sure that works at all as distinguishing Scotland from England, because so, as it happens, I was listening to the radio at 9 o'clock this morning, driving somewhere, talking about James Cook. Going yeah. out from Whitley Bay yeah. in the endeavour to yeah. far from yeah. corners of the world. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, the, the, the English yeah. and the Scots, mainly the English, but yeah. substantially the Scots too, yeah. built the empire. So Absolutely. I'm not sure there's any great difference yeah. no, in, I, in which would support that yeah. particular the sort of category. That I mean, the, the phrase is that the English own the British Empire, the Scots run it. Uh, <laughs> I agree with you entirely. Uh, but I mean, what I was trying, I guess, showing you is how how they themselves are using an argumentation about empire. So, I mean, I tend to judge it very critically and say, well, actually, the historical record suggests something different. But, you know, it's interesting that you're using empire in this way to tell a story about how it includes Scotland. Um, but there's something in, like Renan in there, isn't there, about forgetting. To, to kind of reimagine an open and positive Scotland, we have to kind of forget their imperial sins, as I was saying, not dwell too much on them. Um, because it, not, only does it, not only does it prevent, I think, uh, a kind of reimagination of pluralist of Scotland, but it complicates Scotland's story and it ties it, uh, to anchors it to an English story. Um, and obviously the nationalists want to decouple that the best they can. Um, your first point about multiculturalism in Scotland, um, I share your assessment in terms of, of that kind of arc across Europe. Merkel, you would say where, where has this multiculture been tried? Um, same in France. Um, the UK is a bit more complicated, isn't it, and a bit more mixed. Um, but it's striking that political actors in Scotland will use England as a point of departure on this. Uh, in a way that is not dissimilar to uh, Quebec and Canada, whereas the federal Canadians are multiculturalists, the Quebec are to be interculturalists, and had the federal Canadian call themselves interculturalists, I suspect the Quebec are to call themselves multiculturalists. There's something about a kind of a um, uh, a logic which is inferred from having a, a big neighbour on your border who wants to plough one path for you plough another. I think that, that's kind of just a, a political contingency. But I do think that people in Scotland, because of uh, a different story of racialisation, as I was implying at the beginning with Paul Miles and people like that, haven't had as negative a view about uh, what my call physical difference people in England now. Even though I think race is a problem in Scotland. And I was trying to say, you know, we have institutional racism in police Scotland. Uh, SMI rights in Scotland do say they've been racially discriminated against. Um, if anything, maybe there's less institutional anti-racism in Scotland than there is in England. Um, I mean, they're kind of questions that sociologists of nationalism should be exploring and opening up, but they're not. But I do think, as was portrayed in all of the quotations, there's something about Scotland being more open to the world. Uh, yeah, more comfortable with pluralism. Um, but that's what I mean by aspiration, insofar as, well, let's see it. You know, uh, to some extent, it hasn't been stress tested, has it? Uh, it's okay being benevolent, you know, letting in 2,000 refugees, resettling asylum seekers, when minorities aren't asking for Sharia court, uh, which, you know, which is, one, which is a sharp end of the controversy of claims making that we've seen in England. Whatever your position on this stuff is. Um, and I think the shape of bio case, you know, will take up momentum. And it might be a Stephen Lawrence case in Scotland. And Scotland will have to look at it itself and answer that question, you know, who do we think we are? Um, well, that just suggests Scotland's 
10, 20 years behind England in terms of the arc of development. Yeah. And anyway, I mean... Well, that would be the case if they started at the same yeah. point. And I don't think they're starting at the same point. I think, actually, if anything, it's kind of refraction. It's bouncing off where England is and saying, well, hang on, they're being hostile to immigrants. They're being anti-multicultural. We don't want that. Um, yeah. But interesting question. Thank you. Yes, um, you were showing all these quotes and opinions from MPs and things and MSPs about how bright and beautiful multicultural Scotland will be. When it came to religion, yeah, they became very reticent. Yeah, I mean I've got no Scottish ancestry in me whatsoever, got loads of others, but I know full well if I went to live in Scotland, I'd wear a Glasgow Celtic top, and I wouldn't be seen dead in a Glasgow Rangers top. <laughs> Is it that because of that divide, you know, back to the 19th century, is that yeah. it's still evident, yeah. massively evident, not just the football? Is that why they, they start getting a bit yeah. sort of nervous about talking about religion? Yeah, I mean, it's not, yeah, I think it's not just Glasgow Celtic. I mean, it, oh, it, no, I wouldn't be seen yeah. dead in a house in the Lothian. It might be in the heart and hip, Yeah, hip, exactly, um, hips, no problem. No, no, absolutely. I mean, football. Football sectarianism is an expression of it, mm, but it's yeah. longer, it's more deep-seated, um, kind of more political. Um, but yeah, precisely that, I think the Scottish elite political actors understand state recognition of religious diversity as uh, exacerbating um, religious fragmentism, mm. rather than kind of building a common whole, whatever that common mm. whole looks like. And it's that thing about kind of majoritarianism, just as because they've got an experience of it with that group within their story, they think it'll be mm. the same for other groups and their story. Um, but yeah, but I, I take your point entirely. Yeah, mm. I, think, I think that's the okay. case. I think things have changed, and you know, there's a very lively debate about whether or not sectarianism even exists in Scotland now. And some people take the view that actually, in material terms, it doesn't. I, I think symbolic politics is very important, but I think it does. Um, but um, it's been a very traumatic story for contemporary Scotland to overcome that kind of, you know, sectarianism and violence at one point, and then rhetoric and now kind of symbolic um, stuff. Um, and it's forced Scotland to innovate with legislation. So Scotland has um, equality legislation, which is um, not, not almost symmetrical to Northern Ireland in terms of religious discrimination. Mm -hmm. But in the UK, in England, we have the Assignment to Religious Hatred Act, which is pretty much hollowed out. Mm -hmm. So the Assignment to Racial Act says that anything deemed uh, abusive, threatening, abusive, or the other one, something else. And the Assignment to Racial Hatred was meant to, uh, religious hatred was meant to be symmetrical to that, but it's hollowed out, and so it's only something which is actually an act, um, and has, you have to show premeditation for it. Whereas that's not the case in Scotland, there's something much closer to the Northern Ireland uh, fair treatment stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So sectarianism looms large in the story of contemporary mm -hmm. Scotland, whether or not it's as big an issue as it was in the past. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Threatening, abusive, or insulting. Thank you. Um, just with the sort of, you know, with these, uh, the points of the newspapers and the record, it said, about how the sun changed their headlines in Scotland. Yeah. And, um, it would seem the media is less, at least less right wing than possibly in Britain, and yet the um, the graph which showed uh, whether people thought non white people in Scotland and yeah. Britain, or in Scotland and England, uh, were Scottish or English, Scottish was higher. Yeah. So is that is that just less, is that to do with a less acceptance, or is it just a thing the other way? <laughs> yeah, so, so no, I, th I think you, you put your finger on a <laughs> real tension between uh, yeah. kind of mass opinion and political rhetoric, and kind of goes back to the question that was being asked earlier. Though so you were talking about public policy as well. Um, I mean, one way of answering that is to say that. Scotland's political culture is uh, more left of centre, I think that's fair to say. Um, I don't think the SNP has seen its great success by being 
an identity. I think there had been a story about political economy, um, though kind of having Scotland in your party title helps. Uh, but there is a lag, absolutely. And there is a prevailing view that Scotland, unlike Englishness, is something which, you know, as is the case amongst minority nations, is something that goes deeper. Uh, lots of, uh, when, when, you, when you do the same pattern with Britishness, um, it's, it's very comparable. People in Scotland are as open to people being British as people in England. But there's something that Scotland is a known quantity in Scotland. Uh, you know, it's, it's whatever it is, whether it's a high, high, highland aesthetic, whether it's something else about political struggle, I don't know. Um, but it's clearly embedded and held deeply by lots of Scottish people who seem to instinctively know what Scotland is and that it hasn't radically changed. Um, um, but as I said to you in the talk, that has to be offset to some extent with the fact that that just hasn't prevented the ethnic minorities of Scotland claiming it and claiming it more robustly than ethnic minorities in England are claiming English. Um, so in that respect, paradoxically, Scottishness is a, is a bridge, whereas Englishness is a wall for ethnic minorities. As I said, do you think that, that lack of it, is that a lack of acceptance or just a lack of knowing what, you know, feeling out people coming in to Scotland don't know what it is to be Scottish, as it were. Well, I, I don't think the, the idea of Scotland has been remade. I mean, when I was growing up in, so if you use the example of Britishness for a second, because I think they kind of run parallel and then they break. When I was growing up, Britishness was every bit of, it wasn't Englishness, it was, you know, you're not actually you're British, was every bit as exclusive as I imagine ethnic minorities now say English, uh, being English is. You know, it was wide, it was Christian, it was majority, and the Union flag was a... There were two things that racists used to have, dogs and Union Jacks, right? Um, and now... Well, I still don't like dogs. But, you, but, you, but Union flags aren't a menace. Uh, and that's partly because of, you know, the story... We might narrate it through public figures, people like Bernie Grant, Politically, Diane Abbott holding up a mirror to our society and saying, well, who do you think you are? But also popular culture, Hanif Qureshi, um, uh, people like uh, hey, uh, Salman Rushdie as well, um, kind of remaking what was British Britishness was, this strange entity which exists in this post-colonial condition. Um, and ethnic minorities in, in, in England have, you know, reimagined it. It's whatever else you think Britishness is, I think it's impossible to imagine it purely as a white Christian activity, even though some people will. I don't think it's impossible to imagine Scotchness as a white Yeah. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I watched um, the race also the other in Scotland. Yeah. Uh, psychologically, which is the English. Yeah. So it's, it's perhaps easier to combine against the deeply held belief, which goes back a very long way, and still is sustained by land ownership in the yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and relatively speaking, the numbers of refugees are small. Yeah. And, and I, I think, I'm just wondering whether things would change if it got to a position like, I understand there's a village in Sweden where refugees are two-thirds of the entire population of the village. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, there is the population of the village and, two, and refugees are yeah. two thirds. Um, and a country like Sweden has been massively hospitable yeah. and is switching. Yeah, yeah. Because of, partly in response to the electoral conditions, you know, the far right have a foothold, they're getting, their, uh, they're getting representation. And so, kind of mainstream Swedish politicians have to change their position in response to that, right? Which is what the right always does in terms of electoral politics and it if it shifts the centre ground. Um, in terms of your question about Scotland, I'm precisely, and that's kind of what I was saying. Sorry, forgive me, I should ask my name. Gary. Gary, I, no, you aren't Gary, Gary, my dear. <laughs> yeah. uh, I should have, um, that was the question, that, the response I was kind of offering to Gary, which was that it hasn't been stress tested. Um, and if the conditions change, I don't see why the politics would. Uh, and some of the conditions aren't just population sizes, numbers. But some of the conditions are constitutional questions. If Scotland has responsibility for migration, then those things come up for political debate, whereas they're off the table at the moment. Nobody's banging on the table in Scottish Parliament saying, we need to introduce legislation, we need to introduce an Aliens Act. It's 
it's, it's not a part of the conversation, how can it be? It's not their responsibility. Uh, but were it up for political mobilisation, uh, why wouldn't the UK move on that? Of course they would. Uh, they'd be stupid not to. I mean, it's stupid. Yeah. But well, you know, so, uh, it's an opportunity for, for a political breakthrough. Um, but yes, you're right. I think that Scotland can be more open and benevolent in the current conditions. And if those conditions, there's no guarantee that they will remain the same. Yeah. I think that's about what we've got time for. So thank you. Thank you.